is. He just pulled up sudden as we approached the rock. Ooh. Come on, boy. Come on. Yes. Yeah, boy. Please don't make him, Peter. Well, hoof prints or not, this horse witnessed the murder. Hunter, you have earned a firm in Beaker. The ride from Aix to Ghent was nothing to it. Yes, we've now proved that it would have been possible for Henry Weldon, alias Hamlin Martin, to ride from Hinks Lane to the Flat Iron Rock, commit the murder, and ride back again. And had the tide been right, leave no hoof prints in the sand. He still remains our most likely suspect, Miss, with a suspiciously solid alibi for the morning. When he didn't need it. Yes, odd that. I was watching him at the inquest, and I'll swear he was surprised when the time of death was given out at two o'clock. Oh, well, how much do I... Uh, Bunter, would you mind? A strong odour of fish and prevarication has just roamed through the door. <coughs> Mr Pollock, may I buy you a glass of ale? Uh, luckily we ran into each other like this. I wanted to ask you one or two questions. Oh, yeah. What about? About that chap who was found dead on Flatiron Rock. What about him? He'd be dead, would not he? Yes, yes, poor chap. I was wondering, when you first saw him, was he lying down? Yes, he were. About what time would that be? But never you mind. I weren't taking particulars for the police. I were sailing the bloody boat. Yes, yes, of course. Um, what exactly were you doing off the grinders that day? Never you mind. Why don't you keep your long nose out of my business? Now then, Mr. Pollock, don't know who this is. This is Lord Peter Whimsey. I know who he is. And in fit with the police, he is. Interfering busybody. <laughs> it's all right, Mr. Pollock. I quite understand your feelings, but after all, this is a question of murder. Suicide. What makes you say that? That's what they said at the inquest. I was wondering if you saw anything that might indicate, um... Never you mind what I saw. I, 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 I never saw nothing. And I never asked you to buy me a drink. Next time I'll buy me own drink, have a bit of peace and quiet. Mr. Pollock, I understand your grandson, Jim, who was with you on the boat that day, has come back from Ireland. Who told you that? Tom Baines, I suppose, poking and prying. Would you mind telling him I'd like a word with him? Long-nosed, interferative foreigner. How did you know his grandson had come back from Ireland? Thank you, I didn't. But I thought it was worth a try. <sighs> Do you believe that the Pollocks are hiding the fact that they saw Henry Weldon riding along towards Flat Iron Rock? They're hiding something, I'm sure of that. Well, it's all down to a question of time. We know that disguised as Haviland Martin, he left this pub at 1.30. And that at some time in the afternoon, the Darley garage sent someone to restart his car. Yes, but what time did they get there? Constable Ormond has been requested to check on that very matter. Right, Mr. Paul Whistle. So this Mr. Uh, Mr. Haviland Martin... He asked you to come and have a look at his car. Mr. Martin? Oh, yeah. We saw him on that Wednesday afternoon, didn't we, Tom? Oh, that's, that's right. Asked us to come and have a look at his Morgan. Said it wouldn't start for toffee. So we went to Inks Lane, tried everything, and then we found a fault, didn't we, Tom? 
Fair That's right, H.T. Leeds. As soon as we replaced them, it went right as rain. And what time would this be? You got your timesheet, Tom. Tom will have put it on his timesheet, see? We have to do that so we know how long we spend on all these little jobs. Now, what time did Mr. Martin call us out, Tom? 3 Ah, that's right. 3 p.m. till 4 p.m. And you're quite sure of that? It's down here in black and white. So there it is. A glorious gap in the middle of Henry's alibi right at the time of the murder. Nothing between 1.30 and 3. I hate to disappoint you, but you're forgetting Mr. Perkins. The hiker I met on the road. That is, if you believe he exists. Of course he exists. You saw him. He told me that he'd spoken to Henry Weldon, alias Haviland Martin, in Hinks Lane before he met me on the coast road. So that must have been sometime after 1.30 when Henry left the feathers and before 3 o'clock when the Darley garage people saw him. Yes, but exactly when? And did it give Henry time to ride to Flat Iron Rock, commit the murder, and get back to Hinks Lane. And why hasn't this man Perkins come forward, if he's nothing to hide? Come along now, Mr. Perkins. You've got to make an effort, you know, or you'll never get better. Why don't you read for a little while? Have a look at this newspaper. There you are. Thank you, sister. Oh, no. Is something wrong? No, no, no. Inquest on body on beach. Missing witness sought. Hiker gave name as Perkins. Yes, but I didn't really see. I mean, I didn't have anything to do with it. In that case, much better to get things cleared up. Would you like me to ring the police for you? Right, Mr Perkins. You say you met the young lady, Miss Lane, and you turned and accompanied her back to Darley. Now, I wonder why you did that, sir. Well, I thought I might be able to help. That is truth to tell. I didn't fancy walking past with... I thought the murderer might still be lurking there. Well, why did you think it was a murder, sir? The young lady had only told you that she'd found a body. Oh, I want... I... Where were you, sir, at two o'clock that day? I hope I... you're not going to be long, Constable. Take a sip of this, Mr. Perkins, and try not to get upset. It's, it's all right. I know where I was. I'd walked over from Wilbercombe, and I went into the shop in Darley to buy a bottle of lemonade. We had quite a chat. I'm sure the shopkeeper would remember me. And what time would that be, sir? Uh, I'm not sure. You see, uh, when I looked at my watch a bit later, it had stopped. But, but I asked the time from a man, a camper outside Darley. Oh, yes, sir. And can you describe this gentleman? Uh, I wouldn't call him a gentleman. He was a red-faced man with ginger whiskers and a moustache. had a snake tattooed on his arm and he wore dark glasses. He was very rude to me. And what time did he say it was, sir? Five minutes to two. I know that was right because I set my watch. When I got back to Darley, I checked it by the church clock. Perkins said he didn't want to get involved in a murder inquiry. Him being a London County Council school teacher and having his reputation to consider. So... He takes the train from Darley Hot to Seahampton, sets off walking again, promptly got knocked down by a lorry. Huh. Serve him right. Yeah, but we did uh, check up on him, and turns out he's a member of the Soviet Club, reported to have communist sympathies. Good Lord. Don't tell me Mrs. Weldon's theory of the Bolshevik plot is to come true. <laughs> Inspector, do you think I might borrow the police photograph of the letter found on Paul Alexis? Certainly. Forensic did a good job on this one. Hmm. Thanks to them, we can really see what we're dealing with now. Hmm. Oh, by the way, did you have any luck in tracing that lady? Oh, I forgot to tell you. Yes, it's uh, Olga Cohn, professional model. Lives in Chelsea. 
advertises corsets. Knows absolutely nothing. And we don't know why it's signed Fiodora. No. We're really going to have to decode this letter, Inspector. So Henry now has an alibi for the exact time of the murder. Unless Perkins was lying. I still think Perkins is an unlikely murderer. So is Crippin. Is this your dictionary? No, I found it in the bookshelf. Mrs. Lefranc, may I have a word with you? Certainly, my lord. Um, now, is this your dictionary? Funny you should ask that, my lord. No, it isn't. Poor Mr. Alexis asked me if I had a James Dictionary just after the first of them foreign letters arrived. I suppose there was a word in it he couldn't understand. No, I haven't, Mr. Alexis, dear, I said. Not a Chambers Dictionary, nor any other kind. My spelling has always been excellent, I said, ever since I was a tiny tot. So out he went and bought himself a new one. Why didn't you get a second-hand one, I said. But he said it had to be the latest edition. Now that was Mr. Alexis all over. Always had illusions of grandeur. Thank you, Mrs. Lefranc. You are a mine of information. And all of it useful. Oh, I don't know about that, my lord. I try to keep my eyes open, but I never pry. <laughs> Till I've made you happy too. You know, I think she has made us rather happy. I didn't only come here for the pleasure of your company and to tell you about Perkins. Ah, the coded letter. It's a police photograph of it, which cleverly enhances what the forensic laboratories have managed to reveal. But I thought your friend from the Foreign Office was going to decode it. I'm afraid old Bungo's let me down. He could have done it standing on his head with one eye shut. But when I telephoned the club to tell him that we now had something legible to work from, they told me that he was on his way to China, wouldn't be back for four months. So, I thought you and I. My dear Peter, I haven't got the faintest idea about codes and ciphers. You were the one who worked for intelligence during the war. Come to think of it, how would Alexis know anything about codes? Well, I suspect that the first letter he received would be quite cryptic, written in plain English. It would tell him about the code and direct him to the key word for the next letter, I suggest, in Chambers Dictionary. Then it would tell him to destroy the letter and all subsequent letters. Which he presumably did, apart from this one. Mm. I think I know the kind of code it is. It's not difficult to crack if you know the key word, but um, without it, it's pretty fiendish. And we don't have the key word. How are we going to find it? Well, with the code I have in mind, it never has less than six letters, and in no case is a letter repeated. You do realise I'm supposed to be working on my new novel? Yes, yes, I do. But, um... This will make such a change from um, doing crossword puzzles. Right. The railway timetable uses a bookmark. Dali Holt. Is it too much to hope that this is the page he was working on? Monarch. Mrs. Lefranc said he was always talking about royalty. We know he's always reading about it. Could this be anything? I can't quite make it out. Hmm? Ten. Five, eight, three. I suggest this is a reference to the tenth word on page 583 of Chambers Dictionary. It's the reference Alexis needed for the key word for the next letter, not this one. Why not? Because, my dear Harriet, you always put the key word reference on the previous letter, which is then destroyed. Hang on. This is 583. And this is probably the page he was working on. 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Monarchy. Could they be rank amateurs? Could they have gone and given us the key word? Let's keep very calm and try. Now, may I? Yes, certainly. You, um, you draw a diagram which has five squares either way and 
then you fill in the keyword in the top squares. And then you fill in the rest of the letters from the alphabet, omitting the ones you've already used, of course, and counting I and J as one. So it's uh, B, D, E. Peter, do you think it's possible that these letters at the top right-hand corner represent the address and date? Well, if they are rank amateurs, I think it's highly likely. Because if that is the name of a town, it's got six letters, and the last two are the same as the first two, reversed. Also? Harriet, you're brilliant. You've done this sort of thing before. <laughs> I knew one wordsmith was worth three cyber experts. What have you got? Xnatnix. X N A T N X. Right. <clears throat> now you divide this into sets of two letters, and you find that they form the corners of a rectangle. So you take the opposite corners, W, A. A, a T. R, S. And then our old friends, X, N, reversed, gives us... Yes! Warsaw. Well, <laughs> well, I don't want to jump to conclusions, Harriet, but I think we've cracked it. His Serene Highness. Let's see. B F F Y M G T S. Highness, it is. Oh, Harriet, am I at my time of life to be reduced to hunting for a gang of Bolsheviks? Let us read on. Q J. To His Serene Highness, Grand Duke Pavlo Alexeyevich, heir to the throne of the Romanovs. Marriage of your illustrious ancestress to Tsar Nicholas I proved beyond all doubt. Restoration of imperial rule to Holy Russia eagerly awaited. Photograph of Grand Duchess Fyodora, your bride-to-be, enclosed. Your presence alone needed. On Wednesday, 16th of October, take train reaching Darley Halt, 10.15. Walk by Coast Road to Flatiron Rock. He must have actually believed the Pollocks were going to take him to Russia in a fishing boat. There await the rider from the sea. The rider from the sea. You were right. Yeah. But was he friend or enemy? We know Alexis was killed at 2 o'clock. So... If the rider from the sea was a friend and arrived at 11.45, why did Paul Alexis wait until two o'clock for the murderer? Maybe he was still murdered for the gold. I was going to say that doesn't come up in the letter. Mm, I think that was Alexis's romantic idea. Taking gold coins that could easily be translated into any currency. Besides, the gold was found on his body. I must report to Inspector Druthan.
Nothing. I just wanted to talk to you. Who are you? Pollock, my lord. Jem Pollock. You know who I am? Yes, my lord. Can I have a drink? Chet. What were you doing in Ireland? Now, Jim, I made it known I wanted to see you, and you've gone to the trouble seeking me out. You must have something to tell me. What were you doing in Ireland? Selling the lobsters, my lord. I couldn't sell them around here. Why not? On the account that they were Tom Bain's lobsters. Ah, Tom Bain's having damaged Grandad's nets. Oh, sir. That's what you were doing off the grinders that day, made in Tom Baines's lobster pots. No wonder your grandfather was reticent. Don't tell him I told you. I wouldn't dream of it. Now, Jim, you know that this poor chap was killed on the Flatiron Rock about two o'clock that day. I do, my lord. And as sure as I'm sitting here, he must have killed himself. For there was nobody come nigh him, barring the young lady. But assuredly, dear Mrs. Weldon, you will come back and visit us again. Oh, yes, Monsieur Antoine, I'm sure I shall. I rather doubt it. Unhappy memories and all that. Of course. I understand. But you will save one last dance for me before you leave. Come along, Mother. Whimsy. There you are. You got my message. I'm just off. Off? Where? You know that fellow Bright who said he gave the razor to Alexis? Don't be an idiot, Sally. Of course I know who Bright is. Sir Bright, and tell me where you're off to. London, old son. Presentation of check to Bright the itinerant barber. Hope to get a picture and a final bit of guff about the Alexis death. Final? Well, my editor thinks we've just about squeezed it dry. Besides, they've just found a headless torso in Burke Hampstead. I say I must dash or I miss my train. Shelly Miss Vane, good luck with the new novel. Thank you. So that's that? Almost. Not quite. We must uh, telephone Bunter in London. Look here, Chief. I know. What are you doing here? I thought you were going to Berkhamsted. You've got to present the cheque to Bright first. Who? We offered a reward to anyone who could explain how the razor got into the hands of Alexis. Who's he? The body they found on the rock at Wilvercombe. Oh, yes. Your friend Whimsy talked us into it. I must have been out of my mind. Well, where is this fellow, Mr. Bright, then? Well, Whimsy thinks he may be involved in murder. If so, he probably won't turn up at all. So much the better. I thought the verdict was supposed to be suicide anyway. So it was. But Whimsy thinks... Oh, he has turned up after all. Hello, Mr. Bright. Thought for a moment you weren't going to come. Didn't want to miss out on the reward, eh? Oh, no, Mr. Hart, I certainly not. <laughs> come in, come in. Uh, bring the camera, Joe. In here, Mr. Bright, thanks. This is our news editor. Yes, yes, splendid. Mr. Bright, nice to meet you. Uh, I've I got your cheque right here. I shan't keep you a moment. Are you all ready, Joe? Well, come on then, Sally. Let's get on with it, for God's sake. Just here, Mr. Wright. Mr. Bright, I have pleasure in presenting you with this cheque. <laughs> Sorry. This cheque for £100 in appreciation of your public-spirited behaviour. The Morning Star is always delighted to assist the police and their inquiries. Waste of time and money, really. What line are you going to take? Oh, uh, Morning Star assists police with suicide riddle. I'll never forgive myself for giving the razor to Alexis, says itinerant barber, that sort of thing. Yeah, well, get a quote or two from him about what he intends to do with the money and another photograph. I think he may have moved in that last one. Where is he? Don't say he's gone. Well, doesn't matter. The story's dead now, anyway. Thank 
trouble with this case is it's one step forward and two back. I mean, this letter, which you and Miss Vane have decoded and damn clever too, uh, well, it shows us that someone lured Alexis to the Flat Iron Rock that day. But who and why? Yes, was it a trick to get him there and murder him? The only person with a motive is Henry Weldon, and he has an alibi you couldn't break with a pickaxe. Henry's very lucky with his alibi. Firstly, that his car broke down, and secondly, that he got a lift with Mrs. Morecambe, who was both conspicuous and above suspicion. Well, we can't do anything about that. Ah. Hi, Joe. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's no, all right, my lord. He's probably listening at the door anyway. Percy. Uh, 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 oh, Mom. Uh, uh, <clears throat> the people that Henry Weldon hired the car from, did they say whether he asked particularly for a Morgan? Oh, yes, my lord. They sent us a copy of his letter. It said he wished to rent a Morgan car from October the 15th and was signed Haviland Martin and gave us a reference, a bank in Cambridge. A Morgan car, not just a car. Oh, fragile day, Kalukale, Miss Bain. Will you marry me? Or failing that, will you come with me to Darley Garage and, and commune with Mr. Paul Whistle? I will. Let us be gone. What? The latter. I see the first glimpse of light in the impenetrable gloom. What do you suppose he meant by that? Well, that a two-cylinder car is easier to put out of action than a four-cylinder one, sir. Why, yes, my lord, the fault was in the HT leads. We tried the mag and she was all right and there wasn't nothing wrong with the plugs. So young Tom here, he says, what about the leads, didn't you, Tom? So you took them out, did you, Tom? Well, Never sure. got the chance. Mr. Martin, he says, oh, that'll be it. And before you could say knife, he whips the leads out of the clip. We're well, right, sir, I says. Let the boy have a look at them. And Mr. Martin, he says, Never mind looking at the bloody things. He says, oh, Begging your pardon, miss. Shove a new pair in. And so you did, Tom. Yes. That's right, my lord. Tom got a bit of HT wire out of my tool bag over there, didn't you, Tom? Took me and then me time. and Tom fixes up a new bit of wire, connects it up, and she starts up sweet as a nut. You don't happen to remember, Tom, what happened to the defective HT leads. Well, Funny probably... you should ask that, my lord. Mr. Martin pushed them into his pocket, careless-like, but them leads falls out under the grass again. I expect I've still got them. I thought he won't want them again, but they'll come in useful for a motorbike or such like. So I picked them up and put them in my tools. Nah, ah, there we are. That's pretty sharp. What is it? I suspect the business end of a sewing needle. So that was it. Well done, Tom. That was it. All right, then. How did you know? I didn't. But I've seen it done before. It's a very handy way of holding up a motorcyclist at the beginning of a race. I'm not sure I entirely understand. Uh, with a four-cylinder car, you can run on three, or, if it's a good engine, even on two. But... With a two-cylinder car, like the Morgan, you knock out one and... Precisely. The car won't start and you have to get a lift into Wilburton. So Henry fabricated his alibi. Uh, maybe fabricated, but in cast iron. If only we had an independent witness. Harriet. Now, you know I find you rather overwhelming, so wait in the car. Afternoon, sir. Mind if I join you? It's a free country. So it is. I've noticed you often sit here. Good spot for seeing what's going on in the village. Hmm? <laughs> More than people might think, I dare say. <laughs> you were right there. I don't suppose you remember the Wednesday before last, the uh, 16th. I know it's a bit much to ask. Hey, well, of course I remember. Ain't nothing wrong with my memory. That was the day young men were found dead on Flat Iron Rock. Big red car come through that day at 10 o'clock, driven by Vickers 
lady friend. Uh, his wife's friend. Uh, mutton dressed as lamb. They do say she were an actress. Ah. She had a gentleman in the car with her that day. A gentleman with dark glasses. He was still sitting beside her when she come back at one o'clock. And the gentleman with dark glasses, he gets out of the car and goes into the feathers. And she drives on towards Heathbury. Did you see the gentleman come out of the feathers? Eh, hey, what? D did you see the gentleman come out of the feathers? Yes, I did. Hey. I passed one that were by church clock. Did you see anyone else, uh, a stranger, come through the village about the same time? Uh, no need to shout. There's nothing wrong with my hearing. They can As long as you speak up clear and don't mumble like so many young folk do nowadays. I beg your pardon, sir. Yes. Uh, a rickety-looking, town-bred sort of chap with big glasses, little pack on his back. But in he goes to the shop. And I thinks to myself, if you want the post office, you'll be unlucky. Because they shuts for lunch. But out he comes, and you'll be wanting to wet your whistle, my lad, I thinks. But on he goes, straight on towards Inks Lane. Uh, you'll be one of these pussy foot and slop swallowers, I says to myself. Uh, brought up on fizzy lemonade, all belch and no body. Yeah. Then I thinks to myself, just time for a last pint, I thinks to myself. And into the feathers I goes. You have a remarkable memory. Yeah. Uh, perhaps today you'll be good enough to have your last pint on me. Oh, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh... Get in. Well? It's too good. It's too damn good. Someone, somewhere, is making fools of us. But who? And how? more seriously. 
So here, we slow up the camera to show you the world's professional diving champion, Sam Howard, in action. From the 30-foot board, he does a full gainer somersault. Then from 25 feet, a combination of swan dive and one and a half. If a swan saw this, he'd turn green with envy and migrate. It's only with the aid of a camera lens that we can appreciate to the full the perfect artistry of the springboard. Excuse me a moment. The uh, gentleman who went into number 70, dark hair, wears a beard. I'm sure I've met him before, but I can't for the life of me remember his name. Wouldn't happen to know it, would you? His name is not Bright. He's a highly respected businessman in the city. And his real name is Mr. Morecambe. Morecambe? Well, I never. Here we are, Miss Vane. There. I hope you've got everything you need. Lovely. Goodness, whoever would have thought it. Famous lady novelist, the lord and the police, all taking tea in my front room. I don't think I've had such a thing since the flying Santanas and Mr Bickerstaff and his performing seals was all staying in my house together. <laughs> I've put the crampets in the new chignier to keep them warm. Thank you. Well, that's a turn up for the book, my lord, and uh, Mr Bunter is much to be congratulated. But I'm not sure where it gets us. Bunter? Well, I would say, Inspector, the only reason for Mr Morecambe to pretend to be an itinerant barber was to fabricate a convincing explanation of how the murder weapon came to be in the hands of Paul Alexis. It also means that Mrs Morecambe was certainly in on the plot. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if we found that she attended the concert at the Winter Garden and that she obtained the receipts for the collars that Henry was supposed to have bought that morning just before lunchtime. Well, uh... We can check on that. Percy? So, Henry Weldon never went near Wilvercombe that morning. It's a reasonable assumption. Mm. Mrs. Morecambe could have dropped him just beyond Darling. And picked him up on the way back. But what would be the point of that? Even if we've broken his earlier alibi, uh, the two o'clock one, thanks to Mr. Perkins, uh, is as solid as a rock. And two o'clock was the time of the murder. If it was murder. Cup of tea, Inspector. Oh. Thank you, yes. I think Morecambe, alias Bright, was the brains behind the operation. But why? He's a commission agent. And my friend, uh, Freddie Arbuthnot, tells me over the telephone that he took a few too many chances and there's a rumour in the city that without a large and instant influx of cash, he could be bankrupt. 
So he and Henry Weldon agreed to save Mrs. Weldon's fortune from falling into the hands of Paul Alexis. And shared it between them instead. So Mr. Morecambe would be the one who sent the coded letters and photographs to Mr. Alexis, my lord. I imagine he had a friend in uh, Warsaw, a business friend, who would post them for him. Well, it seems a lot of trouble to take just to get Mr. Alexis to the Flatiron Rock. Ah, but don't forget that the letters formed a dual purpose. To distance Paul Alexis from Mrs. Weldon, even if the murder didn't come off, Pavlo Alexeyevich, heir to the imperial throne of Russia, would hardly be likely to marry an elderly English widow, however wealthy. Hence, Grand Duchess Fyodora. You know, the really upsetting thing about it all is the sheer cruelty of it. To think of that poor man sitting here in this very room, desperately trying to decode those ridiculous letters, which were just designed to play on his pathetic delusions of grandeur. And after all, it was all meaningless. I mean, even if there had been a shred of truth in it, even if his great-grandmother did marry Tsar Nicholas I, even if he had 50 pints of imperial blood in his veins, it still wouldn't make him heir to the Russian throne. Blood. Peter. No wonder it was so easy to persuade him he was related to the imperial Russian family. And Antoine said his joints got stiff. And Mrs. Lefranc said he had rheumatism, which could have meant stiffness. And he never used a cutthroat razor because if he cut himself, his blood wouldn't clot. Of course. The poor man was a haemophiliac. So the fact that the blood was still liquid when Miss Vane found the body... Doesn't mean a thing. He wasn't killed at two o'clock. He was killed at twelve o'clock, the very time for which Henry Weldon went to such pains to give himself an unbreakable alibi provided for him by the respectable Mrs. Morecambe. Whose husband, disguised as Bright the itinerant barber, obtained the murder weapon and presumably gave it not into the hands of Paul Alexis, but to Henry Weldon, the rider from the sea. Well, I think we might have a chat with Mr. and Mrs. Morecambe. Friendly-like. Mrs. Morecambe, very good of you to come, madam, and help us out. <coughs> Mr. Morecambe, glad to be of assistance, Inspector. But I really don't know why you asked me to come all the way down here from London. I don't think I can help in any way. Oh, I wouldn't say that, Mr. Morecambe. Or should I say Mr. Bright? <laughs> well done, Inspector. You want to know why Alfred Morecambe, Commission Agent of London, was going about at Wilverkham disguised as William Bright, that seedy and unsatisfactory tonsorial artist? Yes, that would be helpful, sir, yes. I'm writing a play for my wife. She's an actress, you know. I've always taken a keen interest in the theatre. Really, sir? No doubt it was useful for makeup and uh, that false beard while the real one grew again. <laughs> yes, as you say, I... Shaved my beard, bleached my hair, and became Mr. Bright. You see, I had this idea for a play about an itinerant hairdresser. So I was doing a bit of research, local colour. Simple as that. So you never saw Paul Alexis on the night before he died? Oh, yes, and gave him the razor, just as I said. Or rather, he took it from me. You see, I was trying out this speech about suicide. I'm afraid I got rather carried away. I see. <laughs> you don't know a gentleman called... Uh... Mr. Henry Weldon, sir. Who? Your wife gave him a lift in your car on the day Paul Alexis died. I did tell you about it, dear. Oh, yes. I don't think you mentioned his name. Henry Spencer Weldon, sir. He farms in Lincolnshire. No, sorry. Can't help you. Never heard of him. Oh. Mrs. Stern, do you know this gentleman? Oh, yes. He came to stay with Mr. Weldon last June. I've never seen this woman before in my life. Mr. Weldon's housekeeper, sir. I don't know how you can say that, sir. You stayed more than a week. Well, I didn't see much of him. Him and Mr. Weldon being shut up in the office most of the time with their maps and papers. I don't know what they were working on. But I know it was him. And my husband would say the same. Thank you, Mrs. Stern. Mr. Weldon. I believe you know Mrs. Morecambe and her husband, Mr. Morecambe, alias Mr. Bright. What the devil are you doing here? We agree. Shut up! Henry Spencer Weldon. 
I arrest you for the murder of Paul Alexis Goldsmith. You're not obliged to say anything, but anything you do say may be taken down and given in evidence. I'm not very good at the tango. Flora, do not say such a thing. The tango, it is the dance of passion. And with the right partner, it is the most natural dance in the world. Oh, do I? Forgive me. When I'm with you, I forget myself. Oh. Mrs. Weldon. Oh, Miss Vane. Um, you, you know Monsieur Antoine? Yes, I, I do. Mrs. Weldon, I'm afraid I've got some very bad news for you, and I wanted to be the one to tell you. It's about Paul Alexis. Oh, he was murdered. But I'm afraid the police have arrested your son. Henry. I knew it. <laughs> I knew it wasn't suicide. He loved me. He really loved me. Of course. How could anyone help loving you? Henry. How, how could he have done it? Oh, it, it's all going to be quite dreadful, of course. But you will be brave. Yes. If you, you will help me. Waiter, cognac, s'il vous plaît. Excuse me, my lord, I, I took the liberty of cancelling your dinner engagement this evening with the Antiquarian Society. Butter, you anticipate my every whim. You know, one of these days you're going to leave me and uh, run a pub somewhere or something. A pub? I don't think so, my lord. The old fool who wanted a lover, the young fool who wanted an empire. One throat cut and three people condemned. What a damned awful bit of bloody farce. And Mrs. Weldon would have been next. You don't think that Henry would have killed her? Oh, yes. After he and Morecambe had gone to all that trouble, I don't think they'd have wanted to wait for the money. So as soon as she got back to Lincolnshire, Henry would have found some way sleeping pills or something. And they would have said out of grief for Alexis's death, verdict, suicide. Let's get away. I do hate watering places. We'll dine in Piccadilly. Look out. Thank you. Harriet, I'm going to break our agreement and ask you something. Please don't. All right. But the next time you find yourself in trouble, you might conquer your independent spirit and send for me. I might. <laughs> 